While it took a full year after the movie release for Kenner to put out the very first Star Wars figures, can you believe no one actually thought this movie would do well and sell merchandise at the time? Crazy, right? Fast forward today, Star Wars toys are everywhere, from the classic properties to the new stuff on Disney+. You pretty much can't go down an aisle in any big box store without stumbling across something Star Wars, and the toy aisle in particular has been king of this. Well, there was a time without Star Wars toys. Before Lucas came and sold the property to Disney, and Disney made sequel movies, and before that, when Lucas still owned the property and decided to make the prequel movies, episode 1, 2, and 3, which, of course, also had lots and lots of toys in different scales. And even before this, when the film was re-released in 1997 as part of the special edition, which also got toys, well, before all of this, there was a time when retail said no thank you to Star Wars. Not interested. It's had its run. The Ewok adventures are kind of cool, but we're not interested in Star Wars toys. There were a few things in market after 1984 when Return of the Jedi's toys wrapped up, well, I guess 85 for Power of the Force, notably the Bendem toys from Just Toys. In particular, the Admiral Akbar is a favorite of mine because, I mean, anytime they make an Admiral Akbar toy and he's posed in the, uh, it's a trap pose, it's just, you know, buy me, right? And they didn't really go that deep into characters. But, you know, with bendy figures, do you need to go that deep? Well, nowadays, with Star Wars being property of Disney Corporation, you can walk into pretty much any Disney-related store and find lots of Star Wars product. They have a whole land for this. But during this time, in around 85, well, it was actually 87 when it opened, Star Tours, the first Disney Star Wars crossover, which was a ride at the Anaheim-based theme park, was really the torchbearer, not only for Star Wars Entertainment, but for buying product. When you walked across from the ride, there was a big diorama of a galaxy with terrible, terrible ga uh, gravity problems with all those planets. I never understood how a galaxy could possibly survive with that many planets so close to each other. I mean, just look at that thing. Like, how are you supposed to navigate with that much gravity pull? All right, well, besides that, after you walk past this really colorful diorama, you would get to the Star Trader. Ah, the Star Trader. This was the first place we hit when we went to Disneyland in high school. I was fortunate to live about 20 minutes from the park, and, well, we were frequent visitors, especially of Star Tours and especially of the Star Tour shop. In the late 80s, early 90s, before the special editions, this was it. This was the only place you could find Star Wars merchandise, more or less. I still have some really cool items I picked up from the time, like these cool Galactic Empire frosty mugs that I still have a cold one out of when uh, the feeling hits me, or these awesome Rebel Insignia pins, which are some of my absolute favorites, because they just don't make stuff like this anymore. I mean, heck, they definitely don't make them for the price that they sold them for back then. It's funny that I even still have the uh, price tag stuck on the back of this thing. I mean, four bucks, that was a... That was a good deal, even for Disney markup back in the 94. Well, during this sort of dark time of very few Star Wars product, outside of buying product at Disneyland, there was one item that was at retail, and that was the Galoob Star Wars Micro Machines. And with the framework in mind that I just went over, I want to do a deep dive into the Galoob Micro Machines because this is one of my absolute favorite Star Wars lines of all time, and it does hold a distinction as being the only line that has had some major accomplishments. Now, it shipped as part of the Micro Machines Space Assortment, which also included other spacey properties, such as Star Trek. Because back then, Star Wars and Star Trek kind of needed to ship together, because Star Trek at least had content on the air with the next generation. Star Wars was, at this time, kind of considered done. But Galoob made a bet and thought that Micro Machines would be a great place to celebrate the vehicles of Star Wars. There had been some Kenner vehicle-only lines in the past, not just the ones for 3 and 3 fourth, but Galoob rolled the dice. And they didn't just do the vehicles, they also had some other SKUs in the line, and I'll go over just a few of them for context. They had the minifigures, 
Later on, they rolled out what was called the Action Fleet line, which were slightly bigger, well, actually quite bigger from the Micro Machines. They could fit a little minifigure inside of the cockpit. And this was a notable line because not only did it include so many vehicles, but they also did things like concept vehicles and vehicles based on the books. I mean, until you had the prequels and the sequels and the Clone Wars animated, there really weren't that many ships to choose from once you got through the main movie ships. And then this also led them into their battle packs, where they were able to take smaller items like dewbacks and escape pods, pair them with a couple minifigures, and bam, there you go. There's kind of a nice $5.99 item. And of course, the action packs are pretty notable because they've included some figures like that Ishi Tib there, who has never been done in the 3 and 3 fourth scale, still remains kind of unmade. And then, of course, the infamous Bantha pack number three, which included a Tonica sister, the last one on the left, next to uh, Bib Fortuna there at the top. This is the figure that basically was the reason why we can't get a Tonica sister in the uh, three and three fourth line, because the actress saw this and, well, approached Disney for money. And they said, oh, we're just never going to do this figure again. That's our answer to that. So, uh, yeah, you have this figure to thank and the actress asking for money for that one. Some other items that they did included these sort of snap-together mini, mini playset faces that had an environment and a minifigure that could go inside, and these continued during the whole line, even into the new branding, which I'll get into in a moment, but, you know, an interesting concept. The heart of the line, though, that I really want to talk about are the Micro Machines. So these started off as sets dedicated to just the original three movies. Well, that's all there was at the time. There was episode four, five, and six. The first sets were actually called Star Wars, but then they quickly changed it to Star Wars A New Hope in order to differentiate it from Empire and Return of the Jedi. Each movie got two different packs with three original vehicles each. So two different packs for Star Wars A New Hope, and likewise you got two different packs for The Empire Strikes Back. In this case, a TIE Fighter, an AT-AT, or AT-AT, and a Snowspeeder. The packs definitely had some internal play, like making sure the snow speeder and the ATAT were packed together, although, you know, the scale wasn't quite right, because the capital ships, or the larger items, were pretty much the same size as a personal StarCraft. But, you know what, honestly, as a kid and as a collector now, I didn't care. It was just awesome to get so many Star Wars ships at such a good price point. The size made it possible to really collect them all. And because they offered vehicles from all three movies, even with only two packs per movie, you felt like at the end, like you got a really nice collection. And of course, they came with those great stands there you see in clear plastic at the bottom, which let you display all of your vehicles. Unless, of course, it was an ATSD walker that just was supposed to stand on its own and never got a stand. Although I always thought it kind of could have worked for one, but what am I? A toy maker? Mine always fall over. I always had a problem with the ATSDs tumbling over. Well, a second wave soon followed up, well, actually about a year later, and these packs were no longer movie-based, but labeled uh, pack 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., etc., using Roman numerals, and they each included one previous vehicle and two new ones. So in this case, you would get an ATST that you already had, but you could get a Rebel Transport and a TIE Bomber for the first time. This was pack Uh, five, pack V, if you will, in Roman numerals. So while it was a little annoying having to get a vehicle you already own in order to get the two new ones, well, this was kind of sort of like army building, but I guess in this case you would call it fleet building, where, you know, you really didn't mind getting more of the same vehicle, especially when it was something like a TIE fighter or an X-Wing or an ATST, where there were several of them, if not many, many of them, in the content, in the movies. So, yeah, you know, even though you had to put up with getting one existing vehicle, it wasn't too bad. Eventually, by the last few packs they put out under the original branding, you got three original vehicles, including the second Death Star and Luke Skyhopper, which is one of my favorites. I love Skyhoppers. I will buy any Skyhopper toy they make at any scale. These packs were re-released under the new branding, And at first, all of the new branded packs just got exact carryovers of previous packs, although they reversed the pack out to make it visually look different on shelf, but they were the same SKUs. 
This continued for a few of the packs where, again, you would just get the exact same one from the previous branding, now just on the brighter orange with black and white lined deco on the, on the uh, package for a, a, what's called a package refresh. When the special editions came out in 97, this introduced some new vehicles, and they quickly got Micro Machines, because honestly at this point, Gloop had done almost every single vehicle from the original trilogy. So getting new vehicles supplied by the special editions was honestly a really good thing. In fact, we finally got the original Death Star, one of the only vehicles not done in the original branding from the original trilogy. Everything else was usually from the special editions and the new branding. It's interesting to note that the Death Star was actually first released at Disneyland in the Star Trader as a dangly, as a um, suction cup dangly you could put on your car or your window, and it's a different sculpt than the one that we got in the package. Now, while you might say, well, that's not a Galoob Micro Machine, well, all the other ones in the uh, Star Trader Disneyland assortment were exact Galoob toys, like the Star Destroyer, and they did a TIE Fighter like this, a Millennium Falcon, an X-Wing, really just the main vehicles, but they all came on little danglies, and the Death Star was only available in this assortment, and only at Disneyland. The one that was in the package that finally hit retail was a completely different sculpt, so I kind of treasure this Death Star. It's very unique. Now, I mentioned they were running out of vehicles by this time, the special edition providing a little bit extra fodder for some new additions like the Outrider and uh, s some of the other, you know, like the, the gas uh, turbine from Cloud City. But they did come up with some new ideas, like doing more X-Wings, like with the S-Foils down, or some packs that had battle damage, which were new sculpts of the main fighter vehicles, TIEs, A-Wings, Y-Wings. There was also a pack of battle-damaged X-Wings as well. So, you know, again, for variety. But you could tell they were kind of reaching, because they had exhausted so many vehicles. Shadows of the Empire, when it came out, also infused new vehicle concepts into the line, because, well new vehicles were introduced. Before we had new movies and Clone Wars cartoons and Rebels cartoons and Mandalorians and all that, really, outside of the Ewok adventure and the droids cartoon, getting new things like Shadows of the Empire was pretty groundbreaking because it actually introduced new characters and new ships, and Gloob is one of the major Star Wars toy lines at retail during this time, was very quick to jump on the bandwagon and make many of the ships, some tied to the original bounty hunters, in the line. Another big thing to point out about the Galoob Micro Machine line was the customized packs. Now, for the most part, these were all repacks of existing figures and minifigures that had shipped in different packs. They were just reorganized for retailers who wanted to offer something special. What was really great, though, about the way they would do their combinations, and because of the price point and size of the actual figurines and ships, is Galoob was able to customize the packs to specific retailer requests. So essentially, a retailer could say, I want a $9.99 pack, I want a $19.99 pack, I want a $14.99 pack. Whatever price point they provided Galoob with, Galoob could come up with a solution just by including the number of vehicles and the number of figures that would add up to that price point. So it was really easy to customize to any retailer's need. And you saw these custom packs popping up at almost every single toy store, from KB to FAO to Toys R Us, ah, oh, back when we had toy stores. Now, occasionally they would come out with packs that had exclusive vehicles, like how Darth Vader Star Destroyer from Empire was only available in this giant multi-pack. I think it was Toys R Us, but I could be mistaken. But it was eventually re-released in a basic three-pack. The same with that Death Star 2 that was available first in this bronze-colored pack. Eventually it was released in regular colors. So, well, they kind of more premiered these tools versus making them truly exclusive and not available anywhere else. The fan club also offered two different packs, both a good guy of Han and the Falcon and a bad guy with a standard Star Destroyer and Darth Vader minifig. These were only available to Galoob fan club members, and, well, they don't go for big bucks today. They are definitely treasured by those who own them. The last thing to really point out about the basic vehicles in the Galoob Micro Machine line are the playsets. And the reason is, several of the playsets had very unique vehicles that were not available anywhere else. There were several types of playsets put out. 
Some were larger vehicles like this Rebel Transport that turned into a playset when you took the top off. Others were character heads that transformed, and others were just straight-up environments. And a handful, as I said, had unique vehicles or unique decos of vehicles that you couldn't get anywhere else. So this Planet Dagobah ship, or sorry, excuse me, set, came with Luke's Red 5 X-Wing in Dagobah damage deco, if you will. It had way more deco hits to make it look muddy and dirty, and was the only way in the entire line that you could get this particular version of Luke's X-Wing from this playset. So yeah, if you wanted a full line, every once in a while you'd have to break down and actually buy a playset. This one was a straight-up environment, not a ship that transformed. And of course, as I mentioned, the final version of the playsets were heads that transformed. You would pull down on the top of the face, and it would be a multi-environment. This version of Luke Skywalker that became Hoth included another unique ship. In this case, it was actually a unique tool, or a modified tool. In this case, an at at that's legs were tied together by a, a snow speeder cord, tow cable. So it had both legs fused together, uh, the front legs and the back legs, and then a tow cable, tow cable, tow cable, sculpted around them so that the AT-AT could fall over. And this was the only way this version of the AT-AT was ever available in the Galoob line. And you can see it, you know, does look different from the other walking AT-ATs and was a modified sculpt with new legs on the existing, I guess, body and head. And then finally, the Planet Tatooine playset was the only way you could get the skiff. You had Jabba's sail barge available way back at the very beginning of the line in the original Return of the Jedi three packs, but the skiff, and there were two of them in the movie, the only way to get it was in this playset, and they could, you know, place around the pit of Carcoon, the Sarlacc, and, uh, you know, knock little minifigures into it. There's Boba Fett ready for his death until he was not dead anymore. And here it was, the Sand Skiff, the only way to get it, with the bridge extended and all, with this playset. The only fully tooled original tool that was only with a playset. So it definitely stands out in the line for those factors alone. You couldn't have a complete vehicle collection without purchasing this playset. As the line kind of wrapped up, and especially because they were running out of vehicles to do, the clever people at Galoob started looking for other sources, and they looked at the novels that were out at the time, things like Heir to the Empire and Truce of Pekara, and they came up with a really innovative idea of packaging a combination of ships and minifigures that were specific to the novels. You would get a box that was in the shape of the book, and then opening it up, you would see kind of a burned page blister with a summary on the left and the figures and vehicles packed out in a blister on the right, and then a J-hook to hang in at retail. Well, as ready as these were for retail, and they would have looked really cool hanging there in the toy aisle looking like Toys R Us was actually trying to sell books, unfortunately, the destination for these toy sets backed out at the last minute after they were already tooled and packaged. It was going to be a customized item. So, instead of shipping to retail, the only way to get them was to call a phone number, which you had to get online, and this was the birth of the internet when there were very few websites. So, if you happened to be online right when the internet was starting to emerge and you happened to find this website, you could call an 800 number and place an order to buy them. It was the only way to get them. They never shipped to retail. It was basically their solution to what to do with a product when the retailer backed out of a customized program. Galoob did bring back the Micro Machines for the prequels, and by prequels I just mean Episode 1. In this case, they were reduced to two packs of vehicles with two minifigures, instead of the three-figure combination that you got earlier. They did still come with the stands, which was nice, but you now only received two vehicles and instead of three, and there were limited releases. They didn't cover all of the vehicles from even Phantom Menace, and they were nowhere to be seen for Episodes 2 and 3. By the time Episode 7 rolled around after the Disney purchase, Hasbro, which now owned Galoob, put out, or rather brought back, the Micro Machines for Episode 7. In the assortment, they included both original Episode 7 ships, as well as some classic ships, but it's definitely interesting to note that these were hugely cost-reduced from the original Kaloob releases. 
if you compare the ships of the original trilogy releases with the versions put out by Galoob 15 years, well, 20 years earlier, you'll notice not only do they have way less deco, in fact, usually the, the bottom, which is not seen in the package, had zero deco, but the display stands were eliminated completely. They still had the holes for them, but no stands. A big reason that Hasbro put these out was because Mattel had recently acquired the license for Star Wars vehicles in their Hot Wheels line. And, well, basically to try to compete, Hasbro said, well, we still have the rights to Micro Machines, so let's put those out. And it was basically kind of a turf war between Mattel and Hasbro for who was going to own the vehicle part of Star Wars. Mattel kind of won in the end because Hasbro only put out the Micro Machines for Episode 7, while Mattel continued to put them out for all of the sequel movies. And while there have been a lot of vehicle-based Star Wars lines over the years, everything from the original Kenner line, and again, not just talking about the 3 and 3 fourth, but they had vehicle-only lines as well, to things like Hasbro's titanium die-cast, and like I just said, Mattel had their version as the vehicles in the Hot Wheels line, which oddly are pretty much the same thing, to even the modern lines at retail right now, like Mission Fleet, which is a vehicle-based line with eh, kind of mini, and I hesitate on the term mini because they're not that small, but at least figures that are meant to pilot them, it is a vehicle-based line. Well, not a single one of these lines has ever done every single vehicle from the original trilogy. There has never been an exact recreation down to the Lars Landspeeder since Galoob did their Micro Machines. And that's why I love the Galoob Micro Machine line. It's the only way to get a complete set of original trilogy vehicles all in the same line. Granted, the scale is off between capital ships and starfighters, but, yep, this is my personal set on my shelf in my office. I absolutely love it. They even a Z-95 Headhunter, which should have been in the prequels, but that's a video for another time. Between the variety, between the deco, the stands... And, well, the fact that they covered everybody, good guys, bad guys, bounty hunters, this is one of my all-time favorite Star Wars lines, and if you've never collected it, it's worth tracking down. These guys are so much fun. It's much fun to display, to play with, and I just hope toys like this are still at market for my kids. They're awesome. May the Force be with you. If you like this video and want to see others like it, do subscribe and give it a like. It tells YouTube to share this with other people. I also answer all the comments below, so please leave some. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.